Hello, everyone. Welcome to the GG Dispatch. I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. And you are officially tuned in to the GG Dispatch. Each week on Tuesday, bright and early, we consolidate the week's biggest headlines in gaming news. Whether you're listening in on your commute, during your workout, or you just have us on in the background, we thank you so much for listening in. Speaking of thanks, we wanted to send another thank you out to the kind folks at Audio Technica for providing the microphones that both Alan and I are using, which is the AT2020 USB X. Whether you're just thank starting, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, uh, whether you're just starting out on your content creator journey or you're a seasoned pro, Audio Technica has the products for you. They've got great headsets. They've got these awesome microphones. They've got all kinds of really cool gear. So uh, make sure to check them out. AudioTechnica.com for all of your uh, content creation needs. Um, a little bit of uh, you know. A little bit of early chatter here. I, I got to say, I finished off Scarlet Nexus, finally, uh, after I spent about 25 hours with that game. Um, again, I, I think I talked about it a couple of times on the podcast. Um, fun time, very anime-esque kind of plot and narrative. Has some fun sort of social bonding um, elements as well. Kind of like Persona, but like light. Um and had a good time with it. I could have gone through with the other protagonist to like work towards the platinum or whatever, but ain't nobody got time for that. I've got a backlog to work through. So um, I did start on Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. So I've been spending some time with that game. I'm working on my review for it. Um, but I am procrastinating on GTA 5. I'm sorry, Alan. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but I, you know, I, I was telling Alan before we went live, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to commit spending some time with GTA 5. Like, even if it's like a mission a day or something, um, you, ha- you have my word committed. This is right now, right here. So this time next week, if I don't, if I don't have any more progress on GTA 5, I don't know. I'll, I'll pay some sort of penalty or something. I don't know. <laughs> I will be messaging him through Discord on the daily listeners. Okay. We will get through this journey. We will. We will. And time for GTA 6, right? That's the that's the deadline. Um no, not not that long. It'll probably be done before then. Um all right. What about yourself, Alan? Any anything uh new on your agenda in terms of gaming? Anything that you're looking forward to? Uh not really. Just been playing more Fortnite like usual with the friends and uh Kind of getting a little more hype for Persona 3 Reloaded, especially when they're coming to uh, Game Pass. Yep, yep. I got that like preloaded, pre pre ordered on my on my uh, Game Pass app on my on my um, computer. So I'm looking forward to that coming in. As if we don't have enough games to chew up all of our time. Like I feel like 2023 was like very Fast and Furious, and this early part of the year is the same, but with JRPGs, which is even worse. Because each of them takes like 80 to 100 hours and they're coming in pretty rapid succession. So I'm not I'm going to have so little time for all these games. Um, all right. Well, we've got five stories uh, today, so we'll go ahead and just uh, jump right into that. Um, our first story is more talk on Baldur's Gate 3 not coming to subscription subscription services. This is from um, IGN's Wesley in pool. Uh, basically. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Sven Vink, uh, who was the director for Baldur's Gate 3, says Larian games won't appear on a subscription service. With the de- uh, and I quote, with the debate around the future of video game subscriptions heating up, one high-profile developer has come out strongly on the side of the traditional method of selling games. Multiple subscription services have emerged in recent years with the likes of Microsoft Game Pass, Sony's PlayStation Plus, and Nintendo's Nintendo Switch Online, all providing access to a library of games for a monthly fee. But the potential dominance of subscription services from just a handful of companies has sparked concern about video game ownership, visibility, and preservation. Uh, The thorny issue of video game subscription services was once again thrust into the headlines this week after an executive at Assassin's Creed maker Ubisoft said gamers would need to get comfortable not owning their games uh, before video game subscriptions truly take off. Uh, It's fair to say those comments did not go down well with those who prefer to buy their video games on disc as opposed to downloading or streaming. Uh, And now Sven Vick, uh, boss of Baldur's Gate 3 maker Larian Studios, offered uh, responded to offer a developer's view in a series of tweets. Um, And I kind of to summarize uh, what he said, um, essentially... Whatever the future of games looks like, content will always be king. 
but it's going to be a lot harder to get good content if subscription becomes the dominant model and the select group gets to decide what goes to market and what doesn't go to the market. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, subscription models will always end up co being cost benefit analysis exercises intended to maximize profit, um, which basically was saying like, you need to be able to make games that won't work. Like you need to be able to innovate and do things that on paper don't make sense in order to create something special. And these subscription models are basically all about, you know, quantifying how much a game will make for a service to justify that process, right. Or to justify that investment. Um, now, of course, salt wound, et cetera, uh, you know, and we had talked about this in a previous episode as well. When all of the leaks from Xbox came out, one of the interesting points was that at the time they had we were planning on offering around $5 million, uh to Larian for Baldur's Gate 3 to have Baldur's Gate 3 on Game Pass, which now compared to the overall sales and overwhelming success of Baldur's Gate 3 is a laughably small number. Um, so you know, there might be a little bit of Sven being like, yeah, F you guys, um, <laughs> you didn't believe in our game. So there's no way I'm ever coming to Game Pass. Um, but, you know, I think the the overall argument also carries some weight because I'm, you know, a largely analog guy as well. I'm, I don't look forward to a future that's all digital myself. Um, and so I kind of uh, the, the things that he was saying kind of resonate with me, but I don't know, Alan, what, what was your take on, on these tweets and, and, you know, the general sentiment around subscription services versus um, maybe the standard uh, industry approach. So it doesn't surprise me. They haven't backed down. Uh, it's pretty obvious that they're having a lot of success with Baldur's Gate three and all the, you know, awards are winning. I'm sure they're having strong sales, but I feel like eventually a year, two years on the line, there will get a point where it makes sense to put it on something like Game Pass or PlayStation Plus. I think that for Game Pass and PlayStation Plus uh, Extra and Premium, that they can be a place where games can kind of go to get sort of a, a second uh, wind, uh, so to speak, and, and be able to be introduced to new audiences that may never have given it a, given it a shot. Um, although, you know, I think that people are getting kind of caught up in the fact that xbox puts like their stuff day and date and so they assume that well you know every new game should be their day and date but i think that you can have a mix of stuff that like is day and date that where it makes sense for both the platform in either uh, playstation or xbox and the game and there'll be other games kind of like Baldur's gate 3 where you know it can live on kind of in a more traditional sales sense for like a year or two and then make its way onto a subscription service. So I don't think uh, that subscriptions like Game Pass or PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium are necessarily a bad thing. Um, although I can definitely see uh, his point that he's making of like, hey, if it's all streaming all the time or, or this, I mean, more of like this subscription type service that, yeah, like a lot of stuff will just get no because it's not going to make us any money. We already see that in over on Netflix land right. where a show will get canceled after one season when fans were ready to support and watch more. But to Netflix, it didn't make financial sense to kind of keep it going. Right, um, right. So I, I think in in the sort of uh, the ideal world, we'll, we'll have both traditional and subscription. Yeah, um, definitely. I think um, there is um, something to be said Oh my gosh, I totally just blanked. <laughs> my, I, my brain just derailed one second. Uh, uh, well, while you think about that, I kind of also want to address uh, Captain Ubisoft over here. Like, oh, you should get used to not owning your games. But oh, it's right, like, right, right. Like, you know, again, I don't understand how a lot of these execs don't see what's happening over in movie and TV land. Like, again, uh, in, in Netflix land, where... You know, a lot of titles like Oppenheimer having, you know, a lot of success selling physical copies of those movies, of those TV shows. And not only that, but I think that uh, Hollywood in general is kind of surprised. At like, oh, wait, hang on a second. Like, this is still a really good source of revenue for us. And I think that games will end up being 
like that. Like you'll you'll have like your limit your limited run games, your I am eight bit and all these other sort of niche uh physical game makers and the game makers will still be able to have or have that as a source of revenue. So I don't think it'll disappear completely anytime soon, uh physical copies. Yeah. And and I think it's important to I mean part of the there was a, a quite a bit of outrage online around that quote in terms of not owning their games. And so like, just to make sure that the context is all there, um, you know, this is also from Wes- Wesley and pool. Um, and the, the executive question was uh, Philippe Tremblay, who's the director of subscriptions at Ubisoft, uh, who was kind of talking about this phenomenon and the evolution of subscription services. Right. And so what he said was, Quote, one of the things we saw is that gamers are used to, a little bit like DVD, having and owning their games. That's the consumer shift that needs to happen. They got comfortable not owning their CD collection or DVD collection. That's a transformation that's been a bit slower to happen in games. As gamers grow comfortable in that aspect, you don't lose your progress. If you resume your game at another time, your progress file is still there. That's not been deleted. You don't lose what you've built in the game or your engagement with the game. So it's about feeling comfortable with not owning your game. And he continues to say, I still have two boxes of DVDs. I definitely understand the gamers perspective with that, excuse me. But as people embrace the model, they will see that these games will exist, the service will continue, and you'll be able to access them when you feel like, and that's reassuring. So on the whole, I think like the conversation was more about, look, Netflix exists and is largely popular, right? 20 years ago, you would, if you had a movie collection, right, or your media and movies and TV shows was analog, it was physical, right? And now there's been a lot more of that shift to we stream on Netflix, we stream on Hulu, and and that sort of thing. And so this executive is saying more like, okay, look, if we want that to be successful, it's going to be like a slow progression, and it's going to be a different kind of market to get gamers to say, okay, you know what? It's okay to have a digital collection. It's okay to move this property to a streaming service. Um, and, you know, but it is an uphill battle, right? And so I think there there is a bit more context there that on the whole, I actually agree with, right? So like, and I've talked about this before. I am a very like physical game type of person. I am the kind of person that I don't have a huge game collection physically, If because I buy a game, I play the game and then I sell the game to help me get the next game. Right. Um, There are a few games that I will keep in my collection long term. And most of the time, the games I do want to keep long term, I'll usually wait for them to get on like a really good sale digitally and then own it. And then I own it. I own the digital copy and it's it's just mine because I know I want to be able to go back to it. Right. Um, and so even like the the way that I would go to a more digital, more streaming approach is by knowing that those games still have a value and b like um, staying power. Like that's one thing that's kind of bugged me about Game Pass lately is that, you know, like the Persona games, for example, they pulled a lot of them off the library, right? Like Persona 4 golden and a couple of their titles like they they had them on there for a while and now they're gone um yeah 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 so like so for me you know to be more invested in that sort of subscription or digital approach like if if there's ways for sony and xbox and nintendo to say like hey here's your digital library here are the ways that we're making a digital library or digital access appealing and valuable then I'd be more interested. Right. Um, but right now, if it's like, yeah, pay, pay us monthly. And like, you know, we're going to tease you with all these games. And then three months later, we're going to pull them from the library anyway. Um, you know, that that's, that's not cool. <laughs> that doesn't make me want to stick around. You know, it happened to me with Grand Theft Auto five. Remember I had to switch over to the PlayStation five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, uh, thankfully I didn't, we weren't too deep into it, but I think that Xbox is, or Game Pass has kind of shown that like the standard is like a year. Basically, you get a year to play whatever is here, and if you know if you don't play within a year, eh, you're kind of SOL. So right. I think that I, I don't know if they can just keep something on the surface perpetually. I don't think uh, publishers are down for that. Basically, you gotta you gotta pay up for that mm. access for you know a year or six months or whatever. So, right. in terms of a subscription service, 
that's not coming. If you want to own it outright, you're just going to have to like pay in the Microsoft store like 20 or $30 or whatever it is. Right, right. Yeah, we'll, and we'll see how that evolves. But anyway, I, I think it is interesting to to consider, you know, that that evolution as, as subscription services kind of continue to evolve, um, you know, how companies approach that. Because again, like, I think, you know, Tremblay has a good point there and, and they are seeing like, this is a different demographic. This is a different consumer base. Like they want to own their games. How are we going to help that transition right to a more digital or subscription based future? And not saying it's going to happen overnight, but, um, they want it to be successful. It will eventually have to happen. Um, all right. Story number two. Uh, why Microsoft might be considering Xbox exclusives on PlayStation and Nintendo Switch. And so this was another um, kind of uh, discourse over the past week that got people a bit riled up uh, in terms of Xbox br- having a broader strategy to bring titles to, to more, multiple consoles. Um, and again, this is from Tom Warren at The Verge. Uh, rumors are swirling that micro quote sorry quote uh, rumors are swirling that Microsoft has been considering bringing some Xbox exclusive to rival PlayStation and Nintendo Switch platforms. Sea of Thieves and Hi-Fi Rush have both reportedly been under cross-platform consideration. And when you combine the rumors with recent comments from Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella and micro- Xbox CFO Tim Stewart, it's clear that Microsoft is weighing its Xbox strategy now that the Activision Blizzard deal is complete. Um, at the Wells Fargo at a Wells Fargo summit in late November, Stewart detailed what he described as a bit of a change in strategy. "Quote: Not announcing anything broadly here." Ha! Uh, <laughs> of course, everybody hears this and thinks it's something he's announcing broadly. Uh, but our mission is to bring our first-party experiences and our subscription services to every screen that can play games. That means smart TVs. That means mobile devices. That means we would have thought of it as competitors. Um, in the past, like PlayStation and Nintendo, end quote. So, so yeah, I mean, this this started a bit of a conversation around, okay, well, then, you know, is Xbox still in the hardware game? You know, what's the point of Xbox exclusives, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I don't know, Alan, what was your what was your takeaway on this? That this is, was a really dumb week for discourse. It's just like. <laughs> Xbox is already multi-platform. You could get it on the P. Every Xbox game goes to PC. It's already multi-platform. Right. Same for Sony. Like you can play God of War on a PC. You don't even need a PlayStation to play that game. Uh, right. I believe Horizon Zero Dawn also on PC. It's like it was driving me crazy. Like, what are you guys yelling about? It's like, it, and the thing is, is that it makes sense for them to strategically put them on other consoles, like. Minecraft, if they just lock that down to just Xbox, Minecraft wouldn't have the legs it still has to this day. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, they show that with Ori that went over to the Switch and Hi Fi Rush now. I think they're, they're gonna, they might mm-hmm. put on the Switch mm-hmm. and it makes sense because then it's a chance to sell merch. Like one of the big things at Best Buy, uh, that they have that's like Ori related is not just the game, but all the plushies of all the cute characters. Hi-Fi Rush has, I think, like a little cat that kind of goes alongside the main character. Right, That's right. merch right there. Or a chance to be able to have uh, a show on Netflix like Cuphead. So I think that Microsoft is now thinking, okay, how are we going to maximize the return on our investment? And part of that is going to be putting certain titles on other uh, platforms. Again, I I contend they've already done with PC, but I guess... In terms of like you know the 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 console wars on on other consoles, uh, but like you know they already signed a deal with Sony to put Call of Duty for the next ten years. That means they're multi platform. Uh, right. You know Sony they make uh, MLB the Show and that's on Xbox now. So it's like everybody settle down. It's going to be okay. Yeah, I mean I there's definitely been some of that transitioning right between some of the major platforms and first party titles, you know, like God of war going to the PC. And I remember all the PC players that were were like, were like, this is the end of Sony first party exclusives. Right. And, you know, just kind of all this like drama around that. Um, And I don't necessarily believe that that's like the broader strategy for Sony. I think, like you said, having these titles having these big influential titles eventually making its way to 
other platforms just makes sense in a lot of cases. I think what makes the Xbox conversation a little bit more unique is that I I don't see it as just like, you know, PlayStation releases, you know, Last of Us and a year later says, OK, Last of Us is on PC now or ports it to Switch 2 or something like that. Right. Um it's more of, or at least the, the, I think the fear and the conversation is more about, okay, is Xbox going to be committed to even developing first party titles anymore? If there is no first, first party, right? Like if there is like no real place for them to land from a hardware perspective, you know, like, oh, no, and I, if they I, turn I, into more of like a software company, right? Like that, I think that's, that's what makes it a little bit more interesting. And, and I don't know, like, I, I think that's something kind of interesting to talk about. I, I would disagree with that because I feel like, uh, what's that corporate word? Uh, synergy or whatever. Like uh-huh, uh-huh. I would love to see the data that I, like, I feel would show you that the people who invest most in game pass are Xbox owners, not PC owners, mm. not, you know, some other platform, or the Samsung TV. And again, and, and the weird part about the whole Samsung TV thing is like, it's only Samsung TVs for now. It's like, why not the other TVs? But anyway, yeah, I feel like I can almost guarantee you that the ones who are plowing the most money to Game Pass are Xbox gamers. So if you want Game Pass to be a success, you also need to keep kicking out Xboxes, especially in, in these days where it's like, oh, you know, how much ray tracing, how many frames per second is it getting? And like, Ultimately, the best way to run that is locally on a box. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I know there was, you know, we we got some some peaks potentially right at their upcoming hardware and that there was that focus on on more cloud based hardware and things like that. And so, you know, I think Phil Spencer had mentioned how he feels that Xbox lost the console war when it started when it was mattering the most when people were building their digital libraries. And so it just makes me wonder, like. Yeah, I, I I don't know, I don't know what Xbox's place in the you know the console you know app you know not atmosphere um, ecosystem is going to look like. But to your point, like yes, there there should be a certain level of synergy within the hardware and the software spheres uh, for Microsoft. And so it's just a matter of you know is their strategy going to be we make games. Right. We we partner with a lot of really cool third party companies and we own a lot of awesome first party companies that develop great games and then just put them on every screen that we can. Right. Um, Or is it going to be the more like kind of traditional idea of, hey, we have our box, right? We have our Xbox um, or whatever the hardware is at the time. And we make first party games and they live on that box and you can only get to them in that box. Uh, And so if you want to, you know, the gate to Microsoft (laughs) seven, right, is through this box and that's it. Um, Similar to Sony, et cetera. Now, again, as we discussed, some of those other places are like, yes, you can only access our heaven through our box. But then a, in a year, we'll we'll put a side gate in, you know, <laughs> like you can you can get in for the side gate to the switch or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, but I feel like that's most for people who are like who are never going to buy a PlayStation. They are PC gamers who want to play those games, but like they'll they scoff at getting a PS5. And I also want to remind you that remember, if you own the box, you own the platform, you get a cut of all sales. That's too good to let go. Mm-hmm. Like there's a the, you know Apple makes the iPhone. Because they do make a, a, a you know a good margin on the iPhone itself, but like the vast majority of it is from getting a cut from all the uh, sales on the App Store. Right. So right. like it, you know, the same goes for Microsoft. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um. So yeah, we'll we'll see how the broader strategy shakes out. I just think it's really interesting. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, I I'm still fascinated. And I think I talked about this before. I'm super fascinated that the console war, like, still exists i mean of course everybody's gonna have their sports teams right like you're gonna put on the face paint and you're gonna go out and you're gonna say rah rah and you're gonna you know cheer for you know whichever whichever boxer company you know has has given you uh some great memories and experiences in the online space but at the end of the day i'm like can't we just be excited 
as gamers that all this awesome stuff is happening you know like can we can we hold hands yeah, and like, sing kumbaya or or uh, maybe i'm too idealistic i guess <laughs> no but like the marketing departments of those companies work to like try to engender that feeling you know and then when I someone know. puts in like x amount of money into it like then it gets like really personal like this is a choice i made now i gotta like back it it's it's weird psychology i know, Wait, I know. what what we could talk about here <laughs> i know i know i just i i mean i remember like the you know the, the in the 90s right like sega does with nintendo don't and all that good stuff and i just i guess i thought that the i guess the way that the console wars have sort of evolved or at least i feel like there was a ceasefire for a little while um and now more recently i feel like it's 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 flared up again but um but i don't know maybe i was just uh in ostrich mode uh, uh, in, in a certain period, maybe between, you know, 2000 and 2007 or whatever, whatever that period was where things kind of calmed down. Um, all right. Story number three, um, speaking of, well, I don't know if the speaking of console wars, but, um, really interesting discourse here. Pal world, AKA Pokemon with guns makes a huge splash at launch. Uh, and so this is from IGN, <clears throat> Um, Power World says sells over 1 million copies in just eight hours as Steam servers struggle to cope with launch. Again, from Wesley Yin Pool, uh, quote, Paul, Power World has sold over 1 million copies just eight hours after launch, developer Pocket Pair has said. Power World, dubbed Pokemon with Guns, launched this morning, January 19th, that was a few days ago, and quickly shot to the top of Steam's best-selling games list and broke into Steam's top four most played games list by concurrent players. At the time of the article's publication, Power World had overtaken Battle Royale PUBG into third place with 365,000 concurrent players and a very positive user review rating. That number had since jumped to 1.1 million concurrent players. Um, <clears throat> crazy, crazy. Uh, and so that's happening. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, there's also been quite a bit of chatter around the general design and look and feel of Pal World in that many of the pals, many of the creatures within Pal World look surprisingly similar to Pokemon um and this has of course resulted in tons of memes online from people who are sure that nintendo lawyers are going to come and you know, bury pocket pair and pal world uh and all kinds of other other silliness um to which i believe gene park and jason schreier and, and some other you know games journal folks on twitter are like no that's dumb this game has been in development for years um <laughs> they're not going to start you know, firing up their lawyers because of a Twitter trend. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, Alan, have you, have you seen this game at all? Have you, have you dug into it at all or? Yeah. I've been watching a lot of Twitch streams around it because like, it's not really my type of game. Like the, mm. these sort of like survival, you know, where you got a base and you got uh, to gather resources, not my cup of tea. Like I never got into Minecraft and I, I, I'm not into the Fortnite, like Lego builder mode. And this is very much in like in that vein, um, but I have watched Twitch streams to kind of see like what the big deal is, and I mean like it looks fine, uh, and but it seems like people that like those kind of games are having fun. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there's lots of great great reviews and positive comments, um, and so yeah. I mean, I again, I haven't got into it myself. <clears throat> um, I've done a little bit of like survival type games like building bases and things like that and it does seem kind of cute but again i have a huge backlog right now so i can't you know can't really get into it as much as i would want to um but yeah i just think it's interesting that you know this this game is just absolutely exploding and you know people are are just so sure that nintendo is going to come down hard on this now there is also some additional conversation <clears throat> around the models themselves and how the models look very similar to how the Pokemon are built. And so, you know, not necessarily that they're using like, well, there's there were rumors that they use generative AI for this, which were quickly dispelled because basically there were quite a few experts who were like, no, AI isn't this good. Like, if you want to have 3D models that look like this, AI can't just like pop them out for you. Um, that gives AI way more credit than it deserves. But there's still an there's still a good chance that the models themselves were 
plagiarized is a very strong word. I'm not going to use it, but they look very, very similar to Pokemon models uh, at the mesh. Heavily inspired. Yeah, heavily inspired, we'll say. Um, And so, yeah, that that in itself is a continuing conversation uh, in regards to Pal World and Pokemon relation, etc. So overall, seems like a lot of fun. Seems like a cool game. Lots of buzz around it. Um, But congrats to Pocket Pair. Congrats to the folks at Pal World. If you're playing this game and you're loving it, happy for you. Hope that everything works out and that Nintendo doesn't rain holy hell down on everyone. I don't imagine that they will, but who knows? Yeah, I think it also <laughs> shows that like you don't need to spend like that much money to make to get a big hit. I think they only spent like seven million dollars like developing this thing. So I think as long as you have like a, a good loop and a good and good mechanics and just a game that's fun, people will go to it. Yeah, exactly. And um yeah, and, and you know, there's a lot of chat about like the you, you said you were watching it on Twitch and you know, there were people who really were exposed to this game on on Twitch and letting people stream it and influencers stream it and it got a lot of people going from like, Nope, I don't want to play this game to absolutely I need to I need to get this game right now. Um <clears throat> and yeah, I mean it's it's it traveled quickly. Word of mouth traveled very quickly, so All right. Story number four. Alan, I'm going to let you take the lead on this one about the Xbox Developer Direct 2024 because I didn't watch it. I have no idea what happened. Um, So uh, I'd love for you to give us a little rundown. Uh, What was on display here? What are you excited about? What should what should gamers be excited about? Yeah, so like the Xbox Developer uh, Direct event was really fun. It was last week. Uh, they showed off five different games. Uh, the first one was Avowed by Obsidian. Uh, so this is very much in the same vein as Outer Worlds, where you kind of got that first-person perspective. Uh, it's an RPG. You're in this sort of fantasy world. Uh, you're fighting monsters with different abilities, different weapons. Um, and it felt like what you would expect from Obsidian. Uh, and I think that I don't know if this is going to like light the world on fire, but I think that the people who like those type of games are going to find a lot to like here. Uh, and the one thing though that kind of stood out to me is that even though I haven't played Baldur's Gate 3, I've seen a lot of playthroughs and like the dialogue just felt so mid in this one. Like when you compare to what's happening in Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, so I do wonder now how the game will be viewed with, uh, sort of, uh, you know, now we're sort of like in a post Baldur's Gate 3 world, I guess. Um, and so you can look forward to that one in fall 2024. And then there was Senua Saga, Hellblade 2, Ninja Theory. Uh, it basically looks to just build upon what they had in the first one, which was a really solid game. Uh, visually, it just looks insane. Like when uh, you got a bunch of like enemies like jumping on top of Senua, you can like you can see the pain in her face. Uh, I think there was one where they took like a a bit of a bite out of her, and like you'd see like it's a blood just kind of streaming out from like a bite mark. Um, so that looks to be uh, a very visually stunning title. Um, I'm excited about that one. Uh, And that's supposed to come out in May 2024. Uh, Game number three was Our History Untold. This one is sort of a turn-based strategy game like Civilization. Uh, This looks like a really good release for like fans of that genre. Uh, I think they're trying to sort of set themselves apart by having their uh, sort of like, I guess... It's called like a uh, referred to as like a hero or sort of like the the main leader of like that civilization. Mm-hmm. Uh, are going to be a little more unique, a little bit smarter, a little more personality, uh, and will probably play like a bigger role in the game. Uh, that one is supposed to come out in fall twenty twenty four, and then like the one sort of surprise that kind of came in was Visions of Mana from Square Enix that was not uh, announced prior to the event, and so this one just kind of felt like just Mana, but like it had a more active modern combat system. Yeah, Honestly, I, I, don't... I did see some. I did see some video for Visions of Mana, and I am I'm pretty stoked about that. So <laughs> that looks yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Like I think that like if you're again if you're a Mana fan, you're probably very happy about this. Like, I again, I don't know how it's gonna like. I don't think it's gonna like. Oh, everyone's gonna freak out over it, like a Baldur's Gate three or anything. Uh, that was gonna be summer twenty twenty four, and then lastly, but certainly not least, the Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. Uh, it was a first person adventure game with puzzle elements, and it. It, it can switch between first and third person depending on what's happening on screen. Like, they had an example where uh, Indiana Jones is kind of like 
about to climb up uh, a water gutter. And so the camel kind of like switch over to that third person perspective to kind of, it's just a more pleasing way to kind of like experience that versus like your face being just smashed up against a, 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 a water uh, spout or whatever. Uh, so I'm kind of iffy on like the first person perspective all the time in an adventure game like this one. Um, I feel like for me personally, I'm more excited about like first person shooters than this, but it could be interesting with how they handle like the puzzle mechanics in the game. Cause yeah. I, you know, I think that Indiana Jones, like the whole puzzling thing is like a big part of like the movies and what he does to kind of like get around or escape from enemies or get the treasures. Um, they say that this is 2024, but like, I feel like it's a 2025 game, Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, I felt like they really nailed the delivery with this event. Uh, it gave them, uh, it gave the developers a chance to kind of talk on camera to give their sort of their pitch for like, this is my game and this is why it's going to be awesome in a way that felt way more natural than when they kind of get up on stage at the game awards and they're like, okay, you've got 30 seconds. You got an audience. We're alive. And you got to just do this pitch and it can be pretty cringe sometimes. Um, so this one felt a lot better. Uh, it also allowed people to kind of be themselves and you kind of get an idea of what it's like to work at that studio and the, a sense of what those people are like. And hopefully that means that people can kind of connect a little bit more. Uh, people online can connect a bit more and be a little nicer to game devs. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, so yeah, that was the uh, Xbox developer direct. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, I, I heard good things about the, the show in general. People were pretty excited about the games on display. Um, and as a as a side note, the avowed, um, I think the, it's like the box art. People were like quote tweeting that and stuff like it looks pretty sick. Um, so uh, if yeah, you yeah, that, that key, key art, art is looks very cool. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool key art. So um, <clears throat> and yeah, and help people are excited about Hellblade 2 and, and all kinds of good stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah, interested to see how these uh, how these titles shake out and the t- what the timelines look like for everything. Um, but yeah, uh, for for folks who uh, were staking close to the Xbox uh, developer directs, I hope it was everything that you wanted it to be. All right, last story. Um, sucks to kind of end on a downer, but this is uh, somewhat fresh off the presses, at least for us. Oh yeah, pretty news. Couple. This is like this yeah. happened like an hour and a half ago. <laughs> Yeah, about an hour and a half, two hours ago. Um, so this is from Riot News, uh, or sorry, Riot Games, not Riot News. Um, uh, an important update about Riot's future. Uh, and so this is uh, this is the internal memo that went out, and then it was tweeted out as well. Uh, and this is uh, from uh, CEO really quick. Uh, uh, Dylan Jade. Jadeha, I believe. Apologies if I spell, uh, pronounced that last name wrong. Uh, so Dylan Jadeha said, Rioters, today I'm sharing a decision we hoped we never would have to make at Riot. We're changing some of the bets we've made and shifting how we work across the company to create focus and move us toward a more sustainable future. This decision means we're eliminating about 530 roles globally, which represents around 11% of our workforce, with the biggest impact to teams outside of core development. This also sadly means we'll be saying goodbye to many talented colleagues and friends across all areas of Riot. Um, It goes on to say, in terms of how we got here, since 2019, we've made a number of big bets across the company with the goal of making it better to be a player. We jumped headfirst into creating new experiences and broadening our portfolio and grew quickly as we became a multi-game, multi-experience company, expanding our global footprint, changing our operating model, bringing in new talent to match our ambitions, and ultimately doubling the size of Riot in just a few years. Today, we're a company without a sharp enough focus, and simply put, we have too many things underway. Uh, some of the significant investments we've made aren't paying off the way we expected them to. Our costs have grown to the point where they're unsustainable, and we've left ourselves with no room for experimentation or failure, which is vital to a creative company like ours. All of this puts the core of our business at risk. Um, <clears throat> this the note goes on to say kind of explain how the how the uh, layoff is going to proceed um they are um get offering six months of salary there will be a cash bonus of everyone's individual uh annual performance bonus target even if they joined within the last year um you know 
play, you know, they basically reimbursing a lot of stuff. Um, and they can, you know, they can request a computer from their IT department and like all this other stuff. So basically just saying like, Hey, we're, we're laying you off, but there are a lot of resources here. Um, again, this is like every week, I think without fail, we've had a layoff story to report on. I will say just kind of reading over the memo from, uh, from Dylan, it is, I think they are starting to wisen up a little bit on like how they're structuring the messaging of these, of these uh, memos and, you know, sharing a bit more of the why. And of course, it's nice to kind of be transparent about what the severance packages look like. I mean, it, it, it helps to ease the sting a little bit. Right. <clears throat> so, so that's all good. But once again, it really sucks that when it's the executives that are like swinging and missing, it's always the people, you know, a bit further down the ladder that are paying the consequences for it. Um, no, yeah, definitely. Like, when you read it, it's like, oh, no, it's not about the shareholders, man. And That's not why we're laying all these people off. It's just like, come on. Yeah. Like, really? The company that charges $45 for a skin in Valorant mm-hmm. is, like, hurting for money? Like, come on. No. I just feel like, you know, I once... I, I know there's something to be said for sort of the crazy growth during the COVID era and the kind of like his belief of, like, oh, well, look at all the money people are spending now. Now they're not spending as much. And I get that. But I still feel like they've got plenty of money. Like, they don't really need to lay off. It's just like, it feels almost like uh, in, like in tech companies are like, oh, man, well, if they laid off a bunch, we got to lay off a bunch. Right. So yeah, that's uh, the first yeah. thing they're looking at, right? Let's say, hey, let's take a look at our payroll. Exactly. Where we can trim up some of exactly. this. Yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah. So, you know, man, it's rough, dude. I think it's already like, well, like halfway to what it was last year. And it's only like, not even the end of January. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, it looks like it's probably going to continue to be a thing, uh, and that sucks. Yeah, yeah. Our uh, our thoughts out to any impacted writers. You know, if you've been following the Geekly Grind for a while, we actually toured their their uh, headquarters um, a number of years back, which yep, yep. was super cool. Uh, it was it was really cool to to go in there and see all the awesome statues and um, you know check out their their like custom coffee bar um and everything else like it it was the sort of like workplace that you would expect to see like in silicon valley um and this was around the time that we were we were up there for the final fantasy 15 uncovered event and yeah i I just remember you know me and 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 patrick and and a handful of other grand folks we were just saying hey how awesome would it be you know, to work here. Like if we didn't have to live in LA and pay for LA cost of living, you know, but like we we were really taken in by everything that they had to offer. And so, you know, for, for employees who, you know, maybe working at riot was their life, not lifelong, but you know, like a, a big momentous occasion for them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like and, they, and something they probably work really hard to like be able to get there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so for them to kind of land that role and then, you know, inevitably getting this email right um really my heart goes out to them um but hopefully this this wave um you know we can we can hope that lessons are taken from this we can hope that um you know there's there's more of this accountability there's more of this transparency at the very least uh in terms of how companies are taking care of their people when they have to say goodbye uh which again i do uh respect and appreciate dylan for that but um at the same time <clears throat> you know it's it's about being a good steward of your resources and you know balancing out the the creativity and the risk taking with taking seriously the responsibility that you have as an employer as a ceo for the livelihoods of the people that work for you um and yeah hopefully we see more of that in the future all right those are all the stories that we have for you today. Um, we There are quite a few amazing games coming out in the not-too-distant future. We've got Persona 3 Reload. We've got Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. And, of course, in just over a month, um, the big kahuna, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It's coming. 
it's gonna take oh god all of I my gotta, time. I gotta, I gotta play that Yuffie DLC. Oh god. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, yeah, you gotta catch up on the DLC. I gotta catch up on GTA Five, and you gotta play through all that DLC so you're caught up on that story. Um, but until next time, I'm Jeremy. I'm Alan. Keep gaming, everybody. See ya. <laughs>